Greetings and uh, welcome back to um, some more American government. We're turning the page here this time around, looking at uh, the bureaucracies, the executive branch and the federal bureaucracy. And uh, you know, you hear a lot about draining the swamp, right? Draining the swamp from the current uh, occupant of the White House. It's talking about draining the uh, bureaucracies, basically. And it leads to a question, you know, when you talk about the bureaucracies, what kind of images are um, conjured up, you know, when you hear about, you know, that word, you know, the uh, bureaucrat. So we'll talk about that. We'll get a, a little window, well, big window in uh, on, the, on the bureaucrats. I think it's fairly important. So if you have, um, well going to say turn to a particular chapter in the book. I got some page numbers, some visuals for you to, to look at if you uh, you uh, if you so like. Uh, when we get to that, cross that we'll cross that bridge when we uh, when we come to it. If you have your lecture model, let's take a look at this here. Um, the executive branch and a federal bureaucracy. Uh, some of the major terms we're going to be taking a look at here is um, you know the uh, the Justice Department. You know they they enforce the law. Uh, and basically your administration of justice. Your Interstate Commerce Commission, ICC, uh, no longer around anymore. I think they were dissolved in 1996. They were developed in 1887. They were around for a long time, not around anymore. Uh, they formally regulated economics and services with carriers uh, that uh, transported you know, materials uh, between states, goods and services between states. Uh, alphabet soup, alphabet soup programs. Uh, these were New Deal programs, New Deal agencies. You've heard of some of these, the FDIC, uh, the WPA, right? The Works uh, Progress Administration. Um, FDIC was um, for banks, right? Uh, Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation. Uh, Laissez-faire. Laissez-faire is a French word. It means hands off. Uh, Libertarians like that uh, phrase, that word, uh, when it comes to government. Government should have their hands off of, you know, private sector. The GI Bill, talk about the GI Bill, heads up term there. Um, basically, the GI Bill uh, provided uh, college or vocational education for World War II vets, guys coming back from, you know, coming back from the war. And then glass ceiling, we'll talk about that, the so-called unseen uh, yet uh, unbreachable barrier that keeps minorities and women from rising to the uh, upper rungs of the corporate ladder, uh, regardless of their qualifications uh, or achievements. So the objectives here for this uh, particular chapter, we want to understand what a bureaucracy is. And we want to investigate the operations of a bureaucracy, become aware of the historical roots of U.S. bureaucracy, and then trace the growth of government through the growth of bureaucracy. Because that is where your growth occurs in the bureaucracies. So getting this started off and setting this up uh, as we start to head to the uh, first heading, first section, I want you guys to really know um, the vital stats for the quizzes of the Civil War and the growth of government. Bureaucracies were first developed in China. In China, uh, ancient China, to kind of to rationalize the work of government, uh, to make, make it more objective and less nepotistic. So the, they were designed to ensure that someone was responsible for a specific issue area through, through specialization. So what happened? What happened? Uh, did it change? Or do Americans have an extremely negative caricature uh, in mind? Um, and so what are the bureaucracies? What are they? Uh, why do they exist? So the key factors, the key factors, there is a hierarchical chain of command. Uh, there's a division of labor and specialization, uh, clear lines of authority, uh, and personal rules and merit based decision making. So it's therefore rational, hopefully based on merit. 
it divides up tasks and has clear lines of authority and therefore hopefully accountability, right? So others claim, others claim that is it is an unelected fourth branch of government and that's too large, too powerful and uh, too unaccountable. Now going back to your last Cote Vila reading, and this isn't, he's not making this up, this is true. Cote Vila was talking about how your bureaucracies are really your beating heart of not only, not only the government, but he would say the Democratic Party. Uh, the Democratic Party, and this is saying anyone's bad or good, is the party who believes in the growth of government as an agent of um, uh, civil rights, protecting civil rights and equality. And uh, so therefore, the, bureau the bureaucrats, what Cote Villa would say is, or what he was saying is the bu your bureaucracies, generally, they are dependent on the growth of government for the sec security of their job, right? So um, they become dues payers. There's a federal pot for, for that, for that uh, administration, for, for dues paying. And um, 88, 89% of that from the, the bureaucracies go back into the Democratic coffers and conservatives, Republicans cry foul. This is a big, just nothing but a big slush fund for that political party. But um, so therefore, when it comes time to talking about draining the swamp, cutting government, uh, politicians who, um, you know, advocate that wind up running into some problems with, with, the, with the bureaucracies as a result of that. Now, the roots of the federal bureaucracy in 1789, uh, George Washington, he headed a federal bureaucracy of three departments. And if you're wondering, what would be some legitimate branches of government? Well, maybe when George Washington did it, right? Uh, he found that the State Department was, uh, was needed, um, the Department of War, and the Department of Treasury. They were the three, three major departments. Uh, the heads became secretaries. Uh, growth followed as needs arose. And in general, government grew during times of crises and war. Let's take a look here at your first set of things here I want you to know uh, for the obligatory quizzes. And that's Civil War and the growth of government. The um, Civil War, 1861 to 1865, permanently changed the nature of the federal bureaucracy. You had thousands of employees that were added in order to mount the war effort, right? Uh, poor harvests were a, you know, a serious issue uh, during, during the war. Uh, and the troops, they had to be fed. They had to be fed. So Lincoln created the Department of Agriculture in uh, 1862. Take a look at uh, after the Civil War, growth of the bureaucracy. I think I'm going to sit down for this. For these, I'm a little more comfortable.
So after the Civil War, demands continued to grow. The government needed to pay pensions to the vets and the injured from the war. Legal issues became pressing, so the Justice Department was created, right? So we saw how the Agriculture Department was created. Now the Justice Department, right? We're seeing how uh, historically uh, how this is uh, how this works. I'll try not to knock that <laughs> knock that easel over. This is not easy uh, making this uh, making this adjustment uh, out of the classroom. It's a lot easier then, believe it or not. Now the. Um, Types of nature and government service, looking at the lecture model again here, the types of nature and uh, of government service uh, was increasing and resulted in the rise of in federal, uh, federal employment. And you also need to remember, too, that the, the United States at this time was becoming more, I'm not saying this flippantly here, but more, de more democratic, okay? Uh, think about it, from 1820... Uh, on the electorate was expanding. It used to be white, right, white male property owners, right, and but it changed to all white males after the Civil War, to black males too, to black males. Though um, that was short lived, and and uh, that group didn't get full rights until, unfortunately, till the mid 1960s. But these newly enfranchised citizens who could vote. Uh, we're also making demands, right? Making demands on the government. So in addition, in addition to the war and increasing citizen demand for services, um, there was a good political reason uh, for the expansion of the bureaucracy. And some of those examples would be uh, politics, of course, um, government jobs uh, were used by presidents and party leaders to reward electoral and financial support. So there were incentives for political leaders to expand public jobs. And we ended up having some really junky administrations. Uh, Ulysses S. Grant, after the Civil War, was uh, notable for that, handing out a lot of top positions to buddies and pals and didn't know what they were doing and uh, basically ran the economy into a ditch, 1870s. So, Basically, I'm talking here about the spoil system. So from the spoil system to the merit system, um, you know, you have to ask them, how do they approach their jobs, right? How do they approach their jobs? So from, from the 1830s up through the Civil War, like I said, Ulysses S. Grant's administration, up through probably the 1880s, public jobs became known to be the, what we call the, the spoil system or the spoils of, of politics. When one party won, uh, they would then completely clean house, uh, bringing in their supporters. So by 1880, this had become too political. That became too political. Uh, folks were not doing their jobs because they had no uh, aptitude to do so, since they were someone's political friend. 1883, as a result to try to clean all this up, the Pendleton Civil Service Act came about. And uh, basically, at that juncture, you had to pass tests in order to get to get jobs. And at that point, also, uh, if you were working for government, you couldn't contribute. You couldn't con you couldn't make con campaign contributions. So that brought the business. You know, politicians are going to be looking for uh, money, right? And that brought the business community heavier, uh, more heavily into it. Uh, not that I necessarily have a problem with that, but a lot of people do. So to reduce this patronage, uh, they built up a merit system of, of public jobs on the heels of the Pendleton Civil Service Act. And again, based on competitive exams, uh, a bipartisan uh, civil service commission was developed to over, oversee the reforms. Uh, just 10% uh, of the uh, jobs were covered by civil service. Today, it's 90%. Wow. So it gives job security to federal employees because they cannot be fired uh, due to election results or political whims. They can no longer be forced uh, money, have them be forced to pay for a, a president's political campaign. That was the, uh, I think the Hatch Act, uh, 80s, 90s, somewhere in there, immaterial, I guess, but 
uh, enforce that. Um, they're hired because they're appropriate for the job, right? And they have the, they have the right skills. The downside, the downside is uh, perhaps they have too much job security. Uh, it's difficult to fire someone from government. And, um, you know, the saying goes that when you can't fire someone, you have uh, maybe shoddy workmanship. I know Trump, the, the, this administration here, and I don't know how they're going to enforce this. The bureaucracies are sure not going to work with this because it's their own job security. But the Trump administration um, has um, signed some bill in the law that, pardon me, that um, you can fire government employees for not having, you know, a good work record. I don't know how they're going to enforce that. Now, looking at your, um, back at your, your lecture model here, regulating the economy, the uh, country continued to expand. Uh, new territories became new states, and uh, the federal government continued to get bigger. You know, in response to this, the uh, Industrial Revolution of the uh, late 1800s brought big business uh, into the picture, particularly the railroads, particularly the railroads, the big railroads. And with that, you had price fixing, uh, monopolies, and unfair business practices um, that um, became a growing problem. So in response, Congress created the first independent regulatory commission called the Interstate Commerce Commission, the ICC. And uh, this signified a big, big shift in the powers of government from service to regulation, regulating private business. Uh, over on page 462, um, there is a really nice visual graphic to this. So this helps you um, use the notes to um, study for the quiz. So in 1900, in 1900, uh, Teddy Roosevelt asked Congress to uh, create a Department of Commerce and Labor uh, to oversee employer-employee relations due to intolerable labor practices, you know, we've heard, all heard about these, the child labor issues, low wages, you know, long hours, uh, unsafe working conditions, and uh, the refusal of employers to allow unions to protect employees. Woodrow Wilson later um, separated this department into two, um, since it was difficult, for, he felt, for one organization to represent you know, both sets of um, interests. Take a look now at uh, more on regulating the economy.
So the ratification of the 16th Amendment in 1913 also caused the government to get larger and in other ways encouraged the growth of government. The uh, 16th Amendment allowed the government to tax personal income. This infusion of funds made it easier to support new services, uh, agencies, and programs. So government was regulating business. Government was regulating business, but uh, there were people who did not think that uh, that was the proper role of government, uh, even back in the 1800s. Um, some people followed a laissez-faire attitude toward business. Now, growth of the government in the 20th century. I'm going to head to this section here. Um, FDR faced high unemployment and uh, weak financial markets during the Great Depression. In order to face that crisis, he created a lar large numbers of federal agencies and uh, many federal programs. The Alphabet Soup, the Alphabet Soup, he created uh, agencies like, uh, you know, yeah, AAA and IRA, FDIC, I'd mentioned earlier, the WTA, the Tennessee Valley Authority, TVA, and uh, so on, was quickly passed by, as quickly passed by Congress, but stalled. It was stalled by the... Uh, a conservative Supreme Court. In 1937, the court argued that uh, far-ranging authority to regulate the economy was beyond the purview, constitutional purview, of uh, the president and Congress. So this laissez-faire Supreme Court uh, invalidated much of the New Deal. Um, FDR was frustrated about that, obviously, right? And he proposed adding appointees uh, to the court to change the uh, to change the majority vote. Uh, this is often referred to, and you'll hear you maybe have heard about this uh, as FDR's plan to pack the court. Um, the court quickly changed its mind and began voting in favor uh, of New Deal, uh, New Deal programs. But looking back at the, the model here, um, World War II, World War II. Uh, like the Civil War and World War I, uh, also caused government to grow, right? If, if government growth is a bad thing, wars are, well, we know wars are bad things, but they, they go hand in hand with government growth. Uh, returning vets, right? Think about this. You got returning vets uh, demanding new services when they come back. Um, WW2, like the Civil War and World War I, you know, caused the government to grow, and these returning vets are demanding new services, and it results in the GI Bill, the GI Bill uh, for education, and the uh, Veterans Administration, uh, housing programs, um, the Civil Rights Movement, Civil Rights Movement, and their demands also caused government to grow through agencies like, and we talked about this last chapter, two chapters ago, the Equal Opportunity Employment Commission, the EEOC, and the Department of Housing and Urban, Urban Development, which you've heard of. Uh, and, and these changes and more kind of led us uh, to a discussion of the nature of um, the modern bureaucracy or, or what, today's government, uh, what today's government's like. Well, the modern bureaucracy, the modern bureaucracy... Who are the bureaucrats? Who are the bureaucrats? Well, there are 15 cabinet-level departments in the federal government today, and there are more than 60 governmental agencies and 2,000 other subunits of the United States government. There are about 2.7 million uh, employees in the executive branch alone, and nearly 30% of those uh, work in the Postal Service, 33% um, work for the Department of Defense, and the remaining workers are spread out among the rest of governmental departments and agencies. Just a real quick side note here, uh, back in the early 90s, I was working down in Washington, D.C. As, uh, uh, as a courier, and I would have to do business through my, my employer, employer's 
with the U.S. Postal Service um, in uh, Northeast Washington, D.C. And uh, getting back to the, you know, uh, you can't fire employees. And uh, I just, I had never seen so many employees just lounging around when I went in there. I, I mean, it was just obvious. I wasn't trying to pick on anyone. I was just like, wow, there's a lot of people in here without anything to do. But, um, you know, it got me to thinking that, yeah, you can't fire these people. So, you know, what do they have to worry about? Page 465, there's a nice visual uh, of this. Uh, you know, this uh, a graphic on this for you visual types. Just kind of some ad lib things here for the um, flow, what we're talking about. Uh, most government employees are part of the civil service. That means they have to take a test and they're hired, at least in part, based on their test scores, which are not easy tests. They're not easy tests. Uh, mid and upper level employees generally do not take a written test, but are subject to strict qualifications and guidelines. 10% of the federal bureaucracy is not covered by civil service laws I talked about earlier. Uh, these positions include uh, appointed positions. Uh, about 3,000 people are appointed by the president, uh, some with the advice and consent of the Senate, and senior presidential appointees then appoint the next tier uh, of appointees. You have your independent regulatory commissioners, they're appointed by the president, and then you have your uh, low-level non-patronage positions. So the number of political appointees has grown dramatically, especially under President George W. Bush, 2001 through 2007, went from like 12, uh, 1,230, something like that, up to about 2,000. There's also been a 50% drop in the number of minorities appointed a 20% drop in the number of women. The number of minorities actually uh, dropped under President Obama. President Obama and the number of women as well. Not all federal employees push paper. Some of the most highly skilled and efficient workers in the world work for government. Uh, from biochemists working in the National Institutes for Health uh, to computer programmers in the um, Census Bureau, right? That's big this year, right, Census Bureau, um, in this year of uh, Corona, right, it's 2020 is going to be known as the Corona year, I'm afraid, uh, zoologists at the uh, National Zoo, uh, forest rangers, statisticians, and uh, many more. So federal employees are also, you know, also a diverse lot. Uh, number of appointees, yeah, dr rose dramatically under G.W. Bush. Um, only 11% of your federal workers work in Washington, D.C., right? Surprise, right? 333,000, I think, somewhere around there work in D.C. The rest are scattered in uh, regional, state, and local offices throughout the country. Uh, many, many of these government jobs are also hard to fill, especially the ones requiring high skill levels because the government doesn't pay as much as the private sector does, right? Uh, federal government also relies on hiring outside contractors uh, for um, increasing number of jobs. And this is kind of controversial too because uh, it makes government look smaller than it is and may not always save taxpayer dollars in this trend um, has been exacerbated uh, during the wars in Afghanistan and Iraq. Um, uh, Blackwater was a private security company that was uh, to help the, uh, the U.S. military out. They supplied military equipment. Uh, they do security and got involved in some um, rough tactics uh, over in Iraq. Um, but the private military companies and I played key roles along with other contractors too. Um, but the, the military, the military, like a lot of government, they spend a lot of unnecessary money, right? So uh, one of the arguments about the private contractors is it, you know, supposedly would help streamline how things are done. 
Well, formal organization. Let's take a look at formal organization. Of the bureaucracies. So agencies fall into four major types. You've got your cabinet departments, government corporations, independent agencies, and your regulatory commissions. I'm just going to talk about these um, briefly here. Uh, the cabinet departments, 15 cabinet departments uh, are major administrative units. Uh, that have responsibility for conducting broad areas of government operation. And uh, these positions account for about 60% of your federal workforce. You got 15 cabinets, 60% of your workforce. The departments vary in um, prestige, uh, power, size, and, and uh, access to the president, uh, headed by a secretary for the exception of the Justice Department which is headed by the uh, Attorney General's office. And again, these sections here, if you can keep up with me and you want to write down some extra notes, uh, that's fine. Unless I'm writing it up here or it's in the bold print italicized, you don't really have to know that for the quiz. It's just FYIs here. Uh, government corporations uh, began in the 1930s. Uh, businesses created by Congress to perform functions that could be performed by private business. Um, they're not very profitable. Um, you know, Amtrak, you've heard of that. That would be one uh, government-funded uh, rail system. Uh, Tennessee Valley Authority uh, during the uh, during the New Deal era. You have your independent executive agencies. Uh, they have narrower mandates uh, than a cabinet department. They generally perform a service function. Uh, and not so much a regulatory one. Uh, some examples include the CIA, uh, NASA, 
and the uh, EPA. And the EPA. You've heard of all those, I'm sure. Um, independent regulatory commissions. The independent, independent regulatory commissions, or IRCs, uh, exist to regulate a specific, specific economic activity or interest, such as the National Labor Relations Board, the NL, NL, NLRB, or the uh, SEC, the Security Exchange Commission, just to mention some of the bigger ones there. Um, they're independent, and, and they're independent because once the, their membership's appointed by the president, um, they really can't be removed without cause. And their terms are staggered in office to ensure that no one party uh, gets to uh, appoint all the members. Well, how does the bureaucracy work? How does it work? Um, looking at your lecture model here, something you need to know. Uh, when Congress creates any kind of federal agency, department, or commission, it is actually delegating some parts of its powers listed in Article I, Section 8 of the U.S. Constitution. And this is something a lot of Americans don't like. They're not easy with this. Uh, Congress sets parameters, right? Congress sets parameters, guidelines, and then leaves it to the agencies to work out the details. How agencies execute congressional wishes is called uh, implementation. So these agencies, interest groups too, and congressional committees often have you know, stable relationships and patterns of interaction that are referred to as uh, the iron triangles. And there's a visual for that in your, your textbook on uh, page 483, that would probably be helpful to some of you. And uh, they tend to be fairly autonomous, right? And agree strongly on their goals. Examples of these would be AARP, right? AARP for um, you know your senior citizens who have been targeting yours truly here for the last five years with all kinds of mailing. And I'm not even out of my 50s yet. Nevertheless, uh, Social Security Administration. Social Security Administration would be an example of this. Um, House Subcommittee on Aging. And they all have similar types of interests and expertise. Then you have your issue networks. Issue networks, uh, specialized sets of issues tend to get to know one another through mutual interests. And that has an impact on policy making too leading to this point here, making policy. Uh, in addition to making policy, bureaucracies implement policy by others. So they take the laws made by Congress, the president and courts, and they develop rules and they develop procedures to make sure they are carried out. So since laws and regulations are often written in a vague way, as a result of compromises during the policy making process, there's often a lot of wiggle room. There's often a lot of wiggle room to decide what various passages mean. Uh, these choices are often you know, called administrative discretion and it allows really, when you get right down to it, allows the bureaucracy a lot of power. And a lot of us are not happy with it. Not, we're nervous about this. The bureaucracy, a lot of power over shaping policy and this power is also exercised through rulemaking and administrative adjudication. See, the problem is you cannot, you do not vote bureaucrats in and out, right? You can't see them, right? They're unelected and they're in the bowels of the government. A lot of power given to them and uh, regulations, right? I'm not, I'm not, this isn't a shot at whether regulations are bad or not, but uh, many of them, regulations give them a lot of power and it ensures job security. So again, when you talk about politicians who want to come in or voting blocks who want to cut regulations and slash them, these people are going to die on the hill before they give that up, before they give that up. And then the voters, because really everything comes down to the voter. Um, like right now, I mean, it depends on who's, who's in, but right now it's Trump. Trump obviously hated by the majority of the press and, and the, uh, you know, the, the, um, apparatus of government, 
because his voters are demanding a lot of changes that would, you know, drain the swamp, so to speak. And they're going to die on the hill before they're going to do allow that to happen. And therefore, you know, certain segment of voters are, are hated by uh, the Washington establishment and the press. But all such rules are printed uh, in the uh, in the federal federal register. Uh, they take 30 days to go into effect after after printing. And uh, many of these rules are, are only uh, written only after formal hearings and discussion. Uh, administrative adjudication uh, is a kind of a quasi uh, judicial function in which the federal agency forces compliance with rules through a type of trial. Now, toward reform, kind of wrapping this up here, making agencies accountable, the big question remains, is bureaucracy accountable? And if so, to whom? Uh, they're created by Congress, appointed by the president, funded by Congress, uh, governed by the president, paid for by us, right, by the taxpayer. Um, there is executive control with the bureaucracies. Um, the president has the authority to appoint and remove agency heads, uh, reorganize the bureaucracy, make changes in budget proposals, uh, ignore initiatives from the bureaucracy, um, issue executive orders, right? Reduce an agency's budget. Trump has been doing that. I'm sure his base has been driving that. Uh, congressional control. Congress has the authority. We looked at the president. Now we're looking at Congress's role uh, with the bureaucracies. Congress has the power to pass legislation that alters an agency's functions. Uh, they can abolish existing programs. Uh, they can investigate bureaucratic activities. Uh, they can influence presidential appointments. Uh, write legislation to limit bureaucratic discretion and limit the use of funds or reduce appropriations to the agency. And in the courts, judicial control, the judiciary has the power to rule on whether the bureaucracy is active within the law, right? Uh, rule on constitutionality of uh, issues. Uh, force respect for the rights of individuals through hearings. Hence, the bureaucracy is a subject to significant oversight. A large and diverse number of people work for the government, mainly outside of the capital city of D.C. Is it a nightmare? Uh, is it necessary? Is it something else? And what do you think? So just kind of wrapping this up with a graphic organizer, right? Uh, executive branch steps toward the growth of federal bureaucracy. You have thousands of employees that were added during the Civil War. Agricultural Department to feed troops. After the Civil War, pensions uh, to, for injured vets. Uh, legal issues. Justice Department was formed. Then you had an expanded electorate. All white males and black males, right? New demands, right? New demands. Public jobs for political favors. The ICC, Interstate Commerce Commission, was formed to stop the political patronage. Pendleton Service, Civil Service Act comes into play. You had to, you know, you had to have some skills, right, in order to get the, um, on merit, get the government positions. Uh, personal income tax, 1913, enacted. 16th Amendment uh, funds more programs. You're going to need to pay for them, right? So you got to get the... And, Government creates no wealth, taxpayer money, right? FDR's alphabet soup, New Deal programs, right? All those letters, hey, FDIC and TVA and, you know, all that. Returning vets, World War II, returning vets, uh, GI Bill enacted. Uh, civil rights movement in the 60s, EEOC, Department of Housing and Urban Development uh, enacted. So the effects of government growth, you have... Um, 2.7 million employees in the executive branch to 3, 3 million, 2,000 subunits, 60 government agencies, 15 cabinet-level departments, uh, four categories, regulatory, uh, regulatory agencies, independent agencies, government corporations, cabinet departments, and the mechanics of all this is found in Article 1, Section 8, that... Um, you know, some wide latitude are given to bureaucrats to shape policy, develop rules and procedures, make and implement policy, right? 
and that you cannot, you do not vote them in, right, or vote them out. The only thing you can really read about that is uh, who is in office, right, what their policies are, and uh, who is encouraging that, right, and then maybe get to the bottom of it through, um, you know, making your elective, elected representatives pay for the and pay for that. Okay, um, I will have um, over the weekend a um, some um, or no wait. This is, you guys are seeing this on Monday. Sometime on Tuesday, I will give you guys the marching orders for Wednesday's class. It starts at eight, nine fifteen. Uh, if the work is handed in during that time period, you get the attendance points, right? Uh, part, and after that, uh, there are no participation points either. So, um, so be, you know, be ready to go, 8 to 9.15, I'll have something ready to go. And uh, stay tuned, just keep looking at the uh, my updates and the upcoming feature on our course page. And, you know, hopefully we all, can all get a rhythm with this particular class, okay? Stay well, and uh, if you have any questions, comments, or anything, outside of Sunday, I take off. Um, you can get a hold of me um, at the... Um, uh, desktop throughout the day and night. All right. Take care. Bye-bye.